Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri, and our next guests are the playwright and the star of an incredible uh, new play that is currently running at Lincoln Center Theater. It's called Greater Clements, and in it, Sam Hunter writes of a family in crisis in the midst of a town and a country in crisis, and Edmund Donovan stars in what should be an absolute star-making performance as Joe, a young man struggling with mental illness and the burden he may be placing on others. Please welcome playwright Sam Hunter and star Edmund Donovan. Let's hear it. Hey. Thank, Thank you. So Thank you so much for being here. I want to talk broadly about what the play is about, how it started, but first and foremost, I, I really want to talk about Edmund's performance because I think it's miraculous. <laughs> um, and I hate to put you on the spot like that, maybe make you blush a little bit. Maybe a little bit, yeah. Um, but I know the two of you worked together on a previous show, right? One, you've done one show together? One show, yeah. And I'm curious if this character was born out of knowing what Edmund could do or wanting to challenge Edmund. Were you thinking of him when you were writing it? I actually wrote the show, uh, the current show, Greater Clements. I wrote, I had a draft of it before we went into rehearsals, and I think even before uh, we did auditions. But I remember throughout that process of doing Lewison and Clarkson, I started to suspect that that I, I that we had our Joe. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, Edmund. Um, just a really brief story. Like the, I, I had never met Edmund. It doesn't I, have to be brief. This right. is like a long form interview. <laughs> okay. But it. Uh, but I want Edmund to talk. Um, but the very first time we met was in an audition room uh, for Lewis and Clarkson, and uh, that's a much different play. And that play, uh, uh, Edmund plays a Costco employee uh, who is kind of semi closeted and and has an addict mother and sort of secretly writes short stories and wants to get into an MFA program, uh, and. You, that's kind of a hard role to cast in New York City, where you get a lot of like glamorous young actors, you know, who are kind of bright and shiny. And and Edmund came in, and we'd never heard of him. And and I think you were not that long out of Yale. Yeah, I think it was it was like a year out. Of okay. Um, and it was one of those things where it's like he did the sides, the the three pages of dialogue, and Davis, the director, and I looked at each other, and we were like. It was kind of one of those moments of like, normally when you cast somebody, you're like, oh, I think they have it in them. Mm -hmm. But it was one of those occasions where it wasn't, oh, I think he has it in him. It was like both he has it in him and it's already in the room, which was incredible. Uh, and I mean, we called him back, but I feel like we could have cast you off of the first 30 seconds. I mean, it was incredible. But still a very different part than, very different. than Joe. Yeah. So when you bring... Edmund, when you receive the script for, for Greater Clements, when you're being spoken to about Joe, is there a period of, of workshopping with this character and figuring it out and rewrites when talking about this character? Because you embody it so well, and maybe you're just as good of an actor, but I, I can't imagine just being like, all right, you're jumping in rehearsal, this is, this is your character. It feels like something that you own based off of uh, a convert, really long conversations and figuring out what you well, can and want to do. Thank you, thank you so much. But I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was pretty much, it's, it was pretty close to complete by the time that I did, uh, started rehearsals for it. But I did read another draft of it, but only once around this time last year or uh, yeah, the yeah. end of 2018, probably December of 2018. This is kind of a fun story for me. I did a reading of it and it was the end of, uh, our production of Lewis and Clarkson at Rattlestick, and he and Davis were going to do a production of this play, Greater Clements, at Lincoln Center, the, uh, at Lincoln Center Theater the following year. And you guys were doing a reading of it, and you needed someone to read Joe, and I was in production with them, so I thought it was sort of like a favor, and I was under the impression that I was going to just go read this role that you know they were they needed to hear it out loud, and indeed through the entire three act play reading, I thought that was the case. And then I remember going to the dressing room the next day for the, the play we were doing, Lewis and Clarkson, and my castmate, Noah Robbins, was like, you know, that was your audition, I think. You know, that was kind of like, they were, they were and I had no idea. I was still very green, and am still pretty green and uh, in relatively inexperienced in the professional theater. So I think it was probably better that I didn't know. But, probably. you know, but yeah. But, <laughs> but, um, but that, that's, that is all to say, that is kind of the extent of my hand in workshopping it. Uh, Sam and Davis, or at least Sam, workshopped it at, I know, Ojai and maybe a couple other places, too, The Lark. Yeah, Ojai, The Lark, a few stray workshops here and there. The play's actually, I wrote the first draft about three years ago, so it's been around three years. Yeah, January of 2017, I wrote the first draft. Did you find that you did um, a, a rewrite at all to sort of match the way that 
uh, Edmund attacks dialogue or rhythm? Or did you find as an actor that his rhythms are so clear as a writer that you can kind of yeah, just pick know, it up yeah, by, that's by it. reading it? Yeah, that's it for sure. I mean, that's that would be, you know, um, Sam, is you're, you flattered me so much with the way you speak about the audition. It's so nice. But I feel the same way about him and his writing. It's like it gives me so much. And I think every actor that works with Sam feels that way. Um, it's written so specifically and... And, and indeed, so specific to Idaho, mm -hmm. uh, but, and yet I'm not from there, and uh, many of his actors that he's worked with aren't, and we're all able to find the, the character so easily. Sam writes um, very specifically um, in, in between the lines. He has a lot of uh, parentheticals that indicate words that are thought but not spoken, different types of pauses and silences. Um, so it'd be interesting for someone who's maybe seen his place to read one of them because he's very specific with the way he writes. Yeah, I mean, that's it, it. even when a writer is very specific, it does take a skilled actor, at least instinctually skilled or uh, skilled with the craft, to know how to read and understand those beats and pauses. Yeah. I've seen lots of actors get something incredibly well written and still somehow bungle the language, and you're like, this is fairly clear on the page. I'm not sure why you're reading it that right, way. Right. And I should say, like, Edmund brought so much. I mean, I guess, like, we, I didn't do a lot. I did do rewrites throughout rehearsal, and I think some of them were definitely based off of, yeah. like, things that you were uncovering. But but the, the kind of, the magic, I think, of the, I mean, it's a dumb word to employ, but but the, the, uh, the amazing thing going on on that stage is, like, what Edmund is doing with those words and, mm -hmm. uh, and the sort of nuances and depth that you found with the character that is you and not and not me, you know. Thanks. It must have been a form of heaven to not have to do auditions for this character. Yeah. I can't imagine sitting in an audition room and watch people bring their interpretation of ment this mental, this specific struggle with yeah. mental illness into an audition room. It would be like, no, 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 stop, please. <laughs> You're killing me here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because we didn't actually talk, uh, I don't remember having a lot of conversations about how Joe's specific unnamed psychosis presents itself. We just kind of talked about the guy and how he navigates. Yeah, no, we didn't. Yeah. yeah, someone else asked me that recently. They were like, to what extent was, you know, the way it manifested itself in your body and your voice and all these things, how much of that was Davis and how much of that was you? And I'm lucky, Davis being the director, and or Sam, I, I think they were kind of including both of you in that question. And it was, it was I had a lot of freedom uh, in the way we rehearsed the play to find Joe's, you know, isms. Well, yeah, the play never names a specific illness or a specific no. struggle that he has. We just know that he struggles with, with reality in a way, which is so important because as soon as soon dramatically, as soon as you name it, that becomes the excuse for everything, and everybody basically ends up categorizing the play as the schizophrenia play right. or the, you know, the, other, the other illness play. Um, when you were in rehearsal, how did you and Davis and Sam approach the way that this character would would, would come across to the audience? How how far to go and how much to, to pull back? Yeah, I think there were a couple aspects of his character that were really um, important in finding that behavior. And one of them was his age as it um, contrasts with his social age, as it's described in the play. He's, he's described as having the social intelligence of a 15-year-old, but he's also described as being 27. Um, and I think that there was like that kind of um, uh, paradox that was really interesting to me and, and also gave me a lot in terms of like, that, that seemed like a pretty clear image. Because well, he's struggling you know? with that himself. He himself has been told that socially yes. he's 15 and that is wrong. Right. So when he has the instincts socially of a 15-year-old, yep. you can see his 27-year-old self struggling to not do those things. Yeah, and I think a lot of his behavior is like his attempts at, at normalcy, you know? And some of, the, some of his weirdest behavior or his most strange or sort of um, off-the-mark attempts come from really trying to hit the mark and trying to get better, you know? And that's like really what's so tragic about the way the character's written. Um, Sam, you've written um, a few plays about Ida, Idaho, right? Mm -hmm. Or is it? Would you? Or is it all of them that have been essentially? Uh, I mean, forgive me for no, not, no, no, yeah. no. It's fine. It, technically speaking, uh, the play that Edmund did, Clarkston, is just across the border. That's right. Clarkson, yeah. Washington, yeah. but that's splitting hairs. You could throw uh, a rock, probably. Yeah, yeah, right. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, what has attracted you to 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 writing about where where you're from? Yeah. And how 
difficult. Let me. I, this question is unfortunately going to be phrased with a, a long parenthetical, I think. But do you find it difficult to write these plays about the issues of those places without making them issue plays? Because one of the things that I loved about Greater Clements is it contains everything that we're taught, like a lot of the issues that we're talking about on a daily basis, if we specifically care about what's happening in blue collar America. Yeah. But it never rests solely on one of them, making it a single issue or issue driven play. Yeah, I mean, I to answer the first part of your question, I mean, I, think I, I grew up in Idaho, and uh, I think in the beginning when I was writing plays and uh, when I was going to NYU just down the street here, uh, I started setting plays in Idaho as sort of like a, a way for me to quickly imbue plays with specificity and uh, reality. Uh, so it was kind of a shorthand, I guess. Um, but then as I kept doing it more and more and the plays kept piling up, I think it sort of became... At a certain point, I think maybe like five, six years ago, I realized that it's really about a body of work and not just any one play. And I really want the plays to speak to one another and dovetail off one another. You know, I'm workshopping a current play right now that is very much uh, a response in my mind to Greater Clements. Um, mm. And and then to answer your second question, I think um, there is kind of a political allegory at work in this play, which I don't usually do. Um, because I guess uh, normally when I approach making a play, uh, what I'm interested in is sort of creating a larger field of characters and opinions and outlooks uh, that, and, it, and I really don't want the play to ever feel like I am the playwright, you know, holding captive a bunch of people in the dark and telling them what they should think about particular issues. Um, and so Greater Clements really doesn't have a um, singular political point of view. Uh, it's not, it doesn't have a thesis statement. And I don't really think any of my plays have thesis statements. Uh, I just kind of want to show you people. Though it is very much about the weight of the past burdening us exactly. in, in terms, uh, in effort to move forward in the yeah. future. But I do think, so the initial writing of plays in Idaho was just so at NYU, you didn't have to put like lights up Brooklyn apartment. <laughs> a little bit. And I was also like, <laughs> I was like maybe a little. Like, lights up NYU like, dorm. Yeah. Exactly. And all, <laughs> you, you know, I spent my entire life. Every play has that in it. And you're like, yeah, I can't, yeah. I can't. <laughs> and, and I, you know, I, I, I showed up in New York and I knew nothing. I mean, I knew absolutely nothing. I had lived in Northern Idaho until I was 18 and, and it's all that I knew and New York was overwhelming to me. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, it, I wanna say in the beginning it was almost like a way for me to like write a postcard to my hometown, but it wasn't really ever that. It was just sort of like, uh, I just knew it so well and I felt like I knew that landscape so well and I knew I wanted to be a playwright as well. And so those were the two things that were like most present for me. Uh, and it's just continued to be really fertile in my mind. And it's not like I now sit down and think about, oh, God, what's the next Idaho play? you got to be Idaho. You know, it's like, it's really just... Now they're just kind of coming to you now. Yeah, yeah. And like, you yeah. know, and, and the next, you know, my next play is set in Twin Falls, which is in southeastern Idaho, because I really wanted to write about like a mid mid-sized kind of western city that's a little isolated. Um, I mean, I'm... Isn't Twin Falls mentioned in Greater Clements? Isn't that... That's not uh, where the car Carmike Falls. No, Carmike, Carmike Falls. Thank, Actually, Greater yeah, Clements is the only play that I've written where I've invented towns. It doesn't towns. mention Twin Falls. So, oh. but, uh, yeah, <laughs> where well, both the towns that, that are mentioned in Greater Clements, both Clements and uh, Carmike Falls, are both invented. Okay. Uh, partly because I wanted to, one of the uh, driving plot engines in Greater Clements is that this tiny town had recently voted to unincorporate itself. Uh, and so I didn't want that to be tied to any specific re real town in Idaho. Can I ask you um, a, pr a process question about yeah. writing? Because there are so many elements in Greater Clements that are that are at work, right? There's a political allegory, but then just uh, the text itself, each character is struggling with a very specific objective or, or, mm -hmm. or idea, or multiple. Um, how do you go about writing a new play? Are, are you an outliner first, or do you use the momentum of a rough draft to start something and then go back and start outlining and figure your characters out? What? It's slightly different with every play, um, but it, it's but my usual process, and, and this is not for every play, but my usual process is that I, when I get an idea for a play, I think about it for a really, really long time, and that could be months to years. Uh, and I really don't release myself to write the thing until I know what the ending is. Um, Any notes or anything? Do you know, just maybe. holding I mean, on It's to really it? just like, maybe I'll write an email to myself here and there, but it's really just kind of in my head. And um, So you're not a daily writer? No, not generally. I mean, maybe, maybe now I am just to the point, because I'm also doing some screenwriting here and there, and so like, 
you know, I, I do do that. But no, I mean, like writing for me, I mean, the act of physically sitting down and typing is such a small percentage of the process of developing a play. And usually the writing of the play for me happens fairly quickly because I've, I've spent three years or whatever thinking about the play. Uh, so the first draft comes out very quickly. Um, but then the subsequent development process is very, very long. You know, like I said, I wrote this first draft in January of 2017. Um, How much did you find your draft shifted and changed from that first draft? Uh, quite a bit, actually. I mean, it's, you know, you know it's, a, it's a three act play. It's a big play. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot going on. I don't think the fundamental structure ever shifted. Right. Um, but a lot of the scenes were, well, every scene was fundamentally rewritten. And it was cut, it was cut way down, which might surprise what was your people. How long was your first draft? Uh, close to four hours. I mean, it was, it was very, Amazing. very long. Uh, and now it's under three. And did you rehearse it as four hours and then start? No, I did it. Maybe I did like a reading or something when it was that long. And I knew it was way too, not, I didn't know it was way too long just because like if a play wants to be four hours, a play should be four hours. But I just knew that, I knew that the play didn't want to be that length you know i'm a firm believer as i was telling you backstage and in long plays long movies yeah like, me let's too. go you know if it's yeah. good i'll sit for hours upon hours and hours you yeah. know if the writing is good i'm happy to be absorbed in that it's music it's great um i mean what or actually excuse me something in my throat uh, let's talk about Judith Ivy for a second, who also delivers yeah. a phenomenal performance in this show. Um, she's an actress who's been, she's a legend, you know, uh, she's been working for years. How did you guys find her? How did you cast her? And what is it like working with her every day and developing that relationship with her? Well, it's funny, the reading that I mentioned earlier, doing at uh, Lincoln Center Theater with Sam and Davis, um, Judy was the only other actor that is, that is in our cast that was in that reading. So I feel like I met her kind of a, almost a full year before we started rehearsal. And then um, when we- You knew what you were doing when you did that reading. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't, I didn't, strategic. that's the first time I've heard it that way. But I mean, <laughs> not that they've suggested otherwise, but yeah, I, I, it's, it's an honor. But working with Judith has been such a dream, as you can imagine, she's, yeah, she's, a le she's been a legend in my mind for a long time before I even got to know her. Um, and I, I wrote a card to her and, you know, for opening night and I said, you know, if you told me when I was graduating from drama school that I, you know, two years later I'd be working with you as your son, I, I wouldn't have believed you. You know, it's really amazing. What did she say to that card? Was she? That made I didn't. I didn't see her open it and read it. Oh. I let her kind of have that reaction on her own. But I think she. But she's so down That's to less earth. Of a I'm sure narcissist she, in me. I would have been like, open it, read it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Me, you love so, me, right? Yeah, you yeah. Me. Could you believe that you'd be working with me too? Or yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, but she's she's so down to earth and grounded and has taught me so much about like the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, life of a kind of working theater actor. She's done so much of her career in the New York theater and I've had such a short career so far myself. So it's really amazing to work with someone um, who has so much more experience to offer me. It's a, it's a hacky question and I don't necessarily mean it in terms of, you know, do you take the character with you when you leave? But there is so much emotional uh, turmoil that goes on for both you and Judith throughout the course of this of this big play, as you've said. How do the two of you wind down afterwards? Do you have to wind down, or is it a sort of cathartic exhilaration that you get from doing this within the show that you sort of mm. that you don't need it when the sh when it's over? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I think it's a little bit of both. I think you're right to say that there's there's a lot of catharsis in the play, and there's a lot of release, as you know, of having seen the play, uh, in terms of the emotional weight that sort of builds up over the first two acts, and then there's a lot of kind of a release in a sense in the in the third um, for both of us. And then I think that uh, as, as as it comes, uh, you know. Um, as it pertains to how we come down afterwards, we do it on our own because we get out like we get out of the theater at like 11 p.m. And so I, you know, I live down in Brooklyn and Judith lives uptown, so we part ways. But it's it's uh, it's definitely um, something you need to come down from. Yeah. And um, when it comes to Judith, how did, how were you aware of Judith? Had you worked with her before? What made you think of her for this? I think I mean Judith has been around for so long. I mean, I don't actually even remember when the first time I, I encountered her. Uh, she was a very early idea as somebody, I think she was on our list, like at the top of our list, probably like very, very early on. Um, because we did that, you're right, we did that reading like a year ago. Yeah, I mean, that was, was like December of 2018. Yeah, yeah. and it was just so like clear um, from the reading that she just knew exactly who this woman was. And she made a comment like, uh, 
around the first couple of weeks of rehearsal that um, I hope I'm not betraying anything by revealing this, but she said that she feels like for the first time in a long time she's playing herself. Uh, and that didn't surprise me actually, because like, uh, I mean, not that, you know, she's a very different person from the character in the play, but you can just tell that like Judy has this like really keen eye for this woman. There's a natural fit yeah, there. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. Um, you know, I'm curious, we, backstage we were talking a little bit about um, subverting the dramatic expectations and um, it happens that we were talking about it specifically to something that we can't really talk about on stage, but it happens in, at numerous points within, within the show where it is brought up that, uh, especially I think with Joe, who has very clear expectations from everybody about the horrible things that he could do right. or may do, but does something slightly askew, but still not very good, mm -hmm. but like different from the thing that is expected. What, was that an intention on your part when you're writing that like, okay, well, this is where I'm heading and it's the audience's expectation and I should, I should throw a curveball lightly there, but still give them the satisfaction of that expectation that they were holding. Does that make sense? It's funny. It's, I've, I've never, this is a horrible thing for a playwright to reveal, but I've just never thought about storytelling in terms of plot. And I've just never, you it's know. It's a plot heavy show, I think. I guess. I mean, it's funny. Like, I just like, I don't approach theater making like, okay, what's like the thing, to, you know, the twist, you know what I mean? Like, I, I just never really, like when I write a play, I just always feel like I, I'm feeling my way through the play with the characters emotionally. Um, and if I do have any mechanisms at work, I think it's like, I, I am very interested in the experience of, of an audience of like meeting somebody like Joe who, they meet and I think want to initially keep at arm's length uh, and and maybe even they're a little put off by the guy. Mm. Um, and, and I'm deliberately employing that um, as, and then by the end of the play, I mean, it, I don't think it's revealing too much to be like, he's kind of the hero of the play yeah. um, by its end. Uh, and and I, so if, so I guess that's plot in a certain way because there's like an event structure that leads to that emotional reality, but really it's like, it's it's just like the way the characters are feeling their ways through the scenes, which is is my primary concern. I guess it's um, maybe as someone who, I didn't go to drama school, but maybe the technical term would be dramatic irony or something at moments in the show, right? Where it's like, they have accused him and think that he has done the wrong thing. Yeah. And in a way he has done the wrong thing that he's not supposed to do. But within that, he's done the right thing. The best thing the, in the play. The, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Does that make, like figuring, are, are you ever thinking about that in terms of that sort of dramatic structure or, or dramatic irony is the, you know, yeah, they I guess might so. refer to it. I don't know if that's what they would say. No, no, yeah, yeah. And I mean, honestly, like, I, I don't employ a lot of the terms either. So, but, but <laughs> I... Uh, Only when we're talking about it. Right, right. No, I'm just, like, like, I never, like, think about those kinds of structures when I'm writing a play. But I guess maybe with this play a little bit because I did know... I didn't let myself write this play until I knew what the last three scenes were. Hmm. Um... And so I guess I knew what the sort of like bullseye was emotionally, and so I did kind of arc it that way, I suppose. Right. Interesting. I get okay, you. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we have time for a couple questions from the audience. Who's the question? Hi, um, I'm Cable. Uh, I'm originally from Twin Falls, Idaho. So oh, wow. yeah, I'm excited to see what that's all about. But my question's for Edmund. Uh, what's your favorite part about performing at Lincoln Center? Oh wow, that's that's such a tough question to answer. There's so many good things. Um, I think like I can make it simple and brief. When I get to work every day, I walk by the fountain, and it's like the most beautiful place to walk outside all times of year. One of my favorite places in New York City. And uh, I used to never spend very much time there because it takes me about 45 or 50 minutes to get there. And just having that kind of like, I don't know, that visual every day has really been a treat. Yeah, performing at Lincoln Center yeah. and walking by that fountain every day, there has to be a sense for you as an actor of, or as just a New Yorker of like, holy shit, I'm yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. Like, I've done it. Yeah, people with, you know, cellos and yeah. ballerinas walking by. It's like kind of the idea of metropolitan life in a exactly. way. Exactly. Yeah, it's um, amazing. One more question. Hi, it's for Sam. Um, why did you choose Idaho as the setting of your play? Uh, I think, I mean, like I said, I'm from Idaho originally. Uh, I grew up in a town called Moscow, which is like a college town in the northern part of the state. Um, but I think m more deeply than that, uh, you know, Idaho is not a very populous state. You know, uh, the the entire state is one area code, 208. Um, and is that true? Yeah. 
Wow. Yeah. Well, maybe I. Well, I haven't lived there in a long time, so maybe that's not true. But certainly when I was growing up, right. uh, it was like maybe just over a million people, I think, in the state. Uh, and it's very big, you know, like to to go visit my parents and uh, my grandparents in Boise was a good seven hour drive from from my hometown. And that's I mean, Cable would know being from Twin Falls is a huge state. Um, and there's something about that isolation that really interested me. And especially the fact that I'm writing plays and then plopping them in theaters on 65th Street. Yeah, do you ever worry about, and not that you should, because the the work speaks for itself, but as someone who, I imagine you live in New York, you live in the theater community, by and large, you've been doing that for quite some time, you went to NYU, do you ever have to check yourself when you're writing these plays as to whether or not you're writing about these characters versus you're writing these characters? Uh, You know, it's just become so second nature at this point, I... And I never, I, I think maybe it's a little easier just because I never base characters off of specific people I knew or know. Um, like they're always just, Idaho is just sort of like the landscape uh, that I'm that I'm using. And I also, I should say too, you know, I haven't lived in Idaho. I, I moved uh, to here to go to college in 2000. Mm-hmm. You know, that was 20 years ago now. And I visit frequently, at least once a year usually, because uh, my family's still there. But... You know, there's kind of two separate Idahos going on here. There's the, there's the Idaho that exists right now where my parents still live. Uh, and then there's the Idaho that I've been building play by play for the last 20 years since I left. And, and they're parallel but not directly corresponding to one another. Um, well, guys, I love the show so much. Thank you so much for coming here and Thank talking you. to me about it. It is currently at the Lincoln Center Theater until January 19th, I think y- right. you yep. guys said. Yep. And go see it. It is such a, a, an incredible show and uh, absolutely wonderful to, to sit through and, and, and heartbreaking. Everybody give Sam and Edmund a huge round of applause for being here. Thank you. Thanks, guys.